Once again, good morning and thank you for joining us. We are participating in communion this morning, so if you did not get a cup, if you would just raise your hand, we'll make sure that you get a communion cup. We're continuing our study through the book of Romans, so would you please turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. If you've ever spent much time traveling by airplane, then you know how frustrating flying can sometimes be. You know the scene after a long day of flying, you're waiting for the airplane exit to open, and like a herd of cattle, everyone stampedes their way to the baggage area as everyone is rushing to get their bags and go on their way. But did you ever notice that as while you're waiting for the baggage to come out onto the turnstile, there's always that one piece of luggage that's been there for Lord knows how many hours. It's just sitting there spinning on the carousel round and round. Tragically, this scene appropriately describes some Christians who never have victory over life-dominant sins. And they, too, just go round and round and round in frustration and heartbreak. But it doesn't have to be this way. This morning, we're going to see what the Bible has to say about overcoming life-dominant sins. We're going to pick up our study in verse 11 of chapter 6 and finish the chapter. So we're going to go from verses 11 through 23. And the title of this morning's message is Freed from Sin. Let's pray. Lord, as we open your word, I pray that we would truly allow these words to be written on the tablets of our hearts. Lord, that we would not forget them as we leave this place but we would allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us and minister to us, Lord, reminding us who we are in Christ Jesus, all because of what you did for us, Lord. We commit this time to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, it's been a couple of weeks since we did our study in Romans, right? We had Resurrection Sunday, and then we had Edward Amaya from Far Reaching Ministries here last week. So it's been a little bit since we've been in Romans. So it's important to recap kind of where we're at in the scriptures so far. If you recall, Romans chapters 1 through 5 dealt with the word justification, and remember, the easy, word to, or the easy way to remember what the word justification means is just as if I'd never sinned. Justification, I'm justified before Almighty God. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for all of my sins and yours too once you put your faith and trust in him. Justified means that I no longer have a balance of sin upon my account in God's eyes. In the first five chapters of Romans, we've seen over and over again that salvation comes apart from works. You and I know that there's no amount of good works that we could ever do that would get us into the right standing with Almighty God because it's only the perfect, sinless work of Christ that satisfies the sin debt. So we've spent the last couple of months, actually, talking about justification. But in chapter 6, in fact, Romans 6 through 8, the emphasis shifts, it turns away from the word of justification to perhaps a new word, and that new word is called sanctification. We move from the positional truth of justification to the practical truth of sanctification. Like, that's great. What does sanctification mean? Well, sanctification really just comes from the word sanctify. To sanctify something means to set it apart for special use. And to sanctify a person means to make them holy. So because we are justified positionally, 
that means we are also going through the process of sanctification practically. As Christians, we are set apart from this world to be used by the Lord and to become more like Jesus. So an easy way to remember this, Romans 1 through 5 tells us we are dead in our sin. But chapters 6 through 8 tell us that we are dead to sin. Chapters 1 through 5 tell us that we are free from the penalty of sin because of Jesus. Chapters 6 through 8 tell us we are now free from the power of sin. A few years ago, a little boy came home from Sunday school, and he told his mom that he learned that it was the Apostle Paul's father who was the thief on the cross next to Jesus. The boy's mother was confused. She said, well, how did you get that? Where'd you get such a wild idea? Well, the boy then just simply quoted his memory verse from Sunday school that week, Romans 6, 6, that tells us, my old man was crucified with Christ. <laughs> but that's not what Paul meant. But it's actually not far off. See, everyone has had a father who had a father who had a father going all the way back to Adam. And as we talked before, the fallout from that original sin in the Garden of Eden is felt in every human heart. Every one of us is born with a sin nature. And that's what Paul called and described as the old man. It's the B.C. version of us before Christ. The old man pictures when we were completely governed by selfishness and pride. The before Christ of us was the one that was running away from God instead of running to God. But when we surrender to Jesus, the old nature, the old man was crucified. It's dead. Now God's answer to our sin nature is not turning over a new leaf. God's answer to our sin is not some behavior modification or hypnosis or some psychiatry or reality therapy. The only way to get victory over the old man is to crucify him. Folks, we don't rehabilitate the flesh. We crucify the flesh, amen? Yeah. And by the way, if you go to crucify the flesh, let's just take it physically, practically for a moment, you could put a nail on your feet, you could put a nail on your hand, and, but how are you going to nail this hand? And that's when the Lord brings someone along to do that for you. And it's not always pleasant. All that to say it's not a 12-step approach that we need. It's a one-step approach, the cross of Jesus Christ. The victory is won at the cross, Amen. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, we see practical ways for each of us to continue through the sanctification process, the process by which we are to be transformed into the likeness and image of Christ. Now, as we go through these verses, verses 11 through 23, you may just want to take note or underline how many times the word sin is mentioned. Let's dig in, verse 11. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ, Christ Jesus our Lord. That Greek word translated reckon simply means to consider it so or treat it as if it's true, that it's really true. So when Paul tells us to reckon ourselves to be dead to sin and alive to God, he's saying we should consider it a done deal. Guys, we need to see ourselves in the light of this truth. We are dead to sin and alive in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. The first step to overcoming sin is to change the way we view ourselves. Rather than viewing ourselves as struggling, hopeless sinners, we need to see ourselves as victorious saints in Christ as the Bible describes us. 
But it's not just enough to know this truth. We have to take it a step further and let the truth that's in Christ shape our mind and our thoughts and our actions. I want to be clear before I go any further. This isn't some mental gymnastics. It's not the power of positive thinking. Considering it so does not make it so. We consider it so because it is so, just as the Bible tells us. Many years ago, a sports writer asked baseball's greatest shortstop, his name's Honus Wagner, if baseball was a tough job. Honus Wagner's response was classic, almost legendary. Wagner said, there ain't much to being a ball player if you are a ball player. And the same is true with being a Christian. All of us need to make sure that we're simply living out what we are through Christ Jesus. Our first step to overcoming sin is to change the way we view ourselves. So what's step two? Look at verse 12. Therefore, all right, pause here. You know the adage, when you see therefore, you have to go back and see why it's therefore. So therefore, because you reckon yourselves dead to sin and alive to Christ, therefore, because of that, verse 12 says, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lusts. Is it possible for a Christian to be utterly enslaved to sin? Romans 6.12 tells us plainly and clearly the answer is yes. Paul commands us to not let sin control the way we live, even as believers. Tragically, we've likely all seen it. Christians become enslaved, addicted, even just controlled by sin. Absolutely, a believer can become enslaved to greed and anger and envy and sloth or pride or lust. You know the list. The second step for resisting sin is to not give in to the temptation. The Bible tells us when temptation comes, we do not have to yield to it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, you can look up on your screen. It says, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. To resist sin, we must make the proper choice and fight the temptation. And the best way to resist the temptation is to first off remember who you are in Christ Jesus. I don't need to look at pornography on the computer. I'm a child of God. I don't need to let my anger spiral out of control when someone cuts me off on the 75. I'm a child of God. You get the point. Verse 13 has two sections that we're going to break down. Let's read the first part. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. Pause here. The term your members is describing the various parts of our body. It's our eyes, our lips, our ears, our hands, our mind. You get the point. The point is very clear and practical for all of us. You have eyes that God has given you. Don't use them in the service of sin. You have ears. Don't put them in the service of sin. The Bible tells us if we want to avoid sin, don't allow the members of your body to get involved in that sin. So let's make this a little bit more practical for our times today. You have eyes. Make a covenant with your eyes. Say, I'm not going to watch that garbage. You have ears that the Lord has given you. Make a covenant with your ears before the Lord. I'm not going to listen to that garbage. That's how we help resist sin. I want you to think for a moment. Go back in time to last time you studied David and Goliath. Think about how God used David's hands 
to slay the giant. Pretty remarkable, wasn't it? To pick up those smooth stones and whip the sling. Yet later, David used those very same hands for sin, didn't he? As he committed adultery with Bathsheba. We've all been guilty of using the members of our body for sin. But perhaps none more than our lips. Look at James 3.10 up on your screen. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. How is it that the same mouth we use to sing praises to God is the very same mouth that so often gets us into trouble? Through boasting or gossiping or slander? So verse 13 begins by telling us what we're not to do with our bodies. But the Bible doesn't just tell us what not to do. The Bible also gives us practical instructions of what to do, and that's what the rest of verse 13 says. Look at verse 13. But present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. We're to present, to pre, excuse me, to present ourselves to God as alive from the dead. I want you to think for a moment of what you know about the Gospels as Jesus miraculously, supernaturally raised folks from the dead. Think of Lazarus for a second. Remember Lazarus? He said, Lazarus, come forth. And the sisters were like, Lord, he stinketh. You remember all that, right? Do you think perhaps Lazarus was a little bit excited and enthusiastic to serve the Lord? Maybe just a little bit. Do you think perhaps Lazarus said, Lord, you resurrected me. I'm all yours. I'm fully surrendered. Guys, we are resurrected from the death of sin. We are made alive in Christ. Do we have that same enthusiasm for the Lord? Do we present our bodies to him and say, Lord, I was dead, but I'm alive. I'm all yours. Or is it the first thing we wake up, we say, okay, what do I have going on today? Notice the emphasis in this entire section is on choice. This is purely a decision that each of us have of what we will do with the members of our body that the Lord has entrusted us with. Studies have shown that if a person lives in prison for years, and then they are set free, they often still think and act like a criminal. The habits of freedom haven't been integrated into their life yet. And Satan tries to do the same thing to all believers by lying to us that these freedoms that God tells us in the Bible are not applicable to us. I read the fascinating story recently of two brothers who fought for the right to rule Belgium in the 14th century. The elder brother's name was Reynald, but he was commonly called Crassus, a Latin nickname meaning really overweight. He was horribly obese. But after a heated battle, his younger brother Edward led a revolt against him, and he assumed the title of Duke over all the lands of Belgium. And instead of killing his brother the younger brother devised a devious imprisonment. See, he had a room in the castle built around his brother that only had one door. This door was not locked. The windows were not barred. And Edward promised his brother, Reynold, that he could regain his land and his title any time he wanted to. All he had to do was leave the room But the obstacle to freedom was not in the doors or the window themselves, but it was with Reynald himself. See, being grossly overweight, he could not fit through the smaller door, even though the door was just about normal size. All this man had to do was resist the temptation to eat, lose some weight, and then walk out a free man and have everything he once had as a leader of Belgium. But you know what his brother did? Kept sending him a tray of tasty food 
every single day. You likely know what happened. Reynolds' desire to be free never won out over his appetite. From time to time, some would accuse Duke Edward of being cruel to his older brother. But Duke Edward would respond, quote, My brother is not a prisoner. He may leave when he so wills. He stayed in that room for 10 years and wasn't released until his brother died in battle. By then, his health was so ruined that he died within a year. He was a prisoner of his own appetite. And just as Reynold was enslaved by his appetite, sin will enslave all who yield to it. And sadly, this is an illustration that many Christians personally experience. Jesus has set every believer free forever legally. They have the ability to walk in freedom from sin whenever they choose. But since they keep yielding their bodily instruments and appetites to the service of sin, they live a life of defeat, despair, discouragement, and imprisonment. Brothers and sisters, it doesn't have to be that way. I want you to look at verse 13 one more time. It says, but present yourselves to God. Folks, it's not enough to use, to not use our body for sin. Rather, we're to use our bodies in service of our king, however he so directs. If you remember from our studies in Exodus a couple years ago, the priests were consecrated in their entire bodies to God. Remember, sacrificial blood was applied to different parts of their body. It was showing that their entire body belonged to God and was ready to be used for his service. Look up on your screen at Exodus 29. It says, Then you shall kill the ram and take some of its blood and put it on the tip of the right ear of Aaron and on the tip of the right ear of his sons, on the thumb of their right hand and on the big toe of their right foot and sprinkle the blood all around on the altar. This was a display demonstrating that from head to toe, their body was used for God. Do we have that same view of our bodies? God didn't just give us these bodies to sit around and watch the news or sports or funny videos all day. Now, whenever we talk about sin and resisting, temptation and all these things, lots of people try to quote the Bible and they say, well, if you resist the devil, he will flee from you. Wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. It's not what the Bible says. This is what the Bible says, James 4, 7. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Step one to resisting temptation is not resisting the devil. It is submitting yourself to God. You cannot resist the devil on your own. I pray we're submitted to God this morning. Verse 14. For sin shall not, you may want to underline this, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. For the Jewish person of Paul's day, living life under the Old Testament law and trying to obey it all was everything, wasn't it? But you and I, as believers in Christ, we know that we are not bound by the Old Testament law. We are under the new covenant. Why? Because of what Jesus did on the cross for us. Remember, the Old Testament law is good, it's holy, it's righteous. But no one can keep the Old Testament law perfectly, which means because we are all guilty of the law, the law then condemns us apart from Christ. Aren't you so glad you're not bound by the law? Jesus actually fulfilled all the law, the Bible tells us. Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but fulfill. Praise God. 
at the men's retreat, we're going to have all sorts of bacon. I don't know. Dave, are we going to have bacon? I don't know. We have lots of meat coming. We're calling it meeting Jesus, right? Meat in Jesus. It's going to be awesome. You get the point. Folks, we're free. Verse 15, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Certainly not. Now, Paul's question here is not a repetition of verse 1 of chapter 6. If you look at verse 1 of chapter 6 in your Bibles, it says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? In verse 1 of chapter 6, Paul asked if we could continue in sin. But here in verse 15, the wording is different. He says, shall we sin? Verse 1, he was looking at continual, habitual sin. Here in verse 15, he's talking about those specific acts of sin. The Bible is clear that a lifestyle of habitual sin, listen carefully, a lifestyle of habitual sin is not compatible with a person whose life has been changed by the grace of Jesus Christ. But what about the occasional sin here and there? If we're under grace and not the law, do we even need to be concerned about, you know, a little sin here and a little sin there? The answer is yes, and here's why. Verse 16. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? We've mentioned it before in our study of Romans. Everybody serves somebody. And whatever it is you present yourself to obey, you become its servant. For example, if I obey my appetite every time my tummy rumbles, guess what? I am now serving my appetite. The Bible tells us clearly, clearly, we have a choice in whom we serve. Sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. We choose. Verse 17. But God be thanked that though, you may want to underline this, star this, highlight this, write in your neighbor's Bible, they won't mind. <laughs> but God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin. You see that past tense? You were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Obeyed from the heart is a wonderful description of faith. It shows that faith comes not just from an intellectual exercise, but it comes from that belief in the heart. Faith results in obedient actions. Because if we truly believe something, we're going to act accordingly to that belief. Let me give you an example. When church is over today and I go out to my car and I believe my car's going to start, am I just going to sit there and look at it and be like, yeah, hey, I guess I'm going to walk? No, I believe my car's going to start. I'm going to grab my key, unlock the car, turn the ignition and go, right? Why? Because I believe my car is going to work. If I believe that electricity is flowing through my house, I'm not going to sit in the dark at night. What am I going to do? I'm going to flip a light switch. Faith's results into actions according to that belief. I want to say it again. Faith results in actions according to that belief. If our faith is not leading to obedient actions, then folks, we have to really ask ourselves, do we truly believe it? We should spend a moment on that phrase here in the verse that says, that form of doctrine. Do you see that in your Bible? The word form is speaking of a physical mold that was used to shape molten metal. And this presents a beautiful picture of God as he works in our lives. First, he melts us by the work of the Holy Spirit and the power of his word. And then he pours us into his mold of truth, that form of doctrine, and then he continues to shape us into his image. You know what that's describing, don't you? 
the process of sanctification. So why not then just kind of, you know, kind of occasionally sin, let our hair down a little bit. It's not a big deal, right? Let's go have some fun according to the world. Why shouldn't we do that? Because sin is not our master. We don't serve sin. We serve Jesus. Amen? Verse 18. And having been, you may want to underline this, having been set free from sin, it is already done. You became slaves of righteousness. What does it mean to be free from sin and to become a slave of righteousness? It means that sin is no longer our boss. Sin is no longer calling the shots. As Christians, righteousness is our boss. Righteousness should be calling the shots. To be set free from sin means that we never have to sin again. Though sin is inevitable, Until this flesh passes, it is clear that God has not designed the world to where we have to sin. We don't have to sin. But we will, won't we? We all fall short. This is a great reminder of what is sin. People say, well, it's doing something bad. No. Sin simply means to miss the mark. It's an archery term to miss the mark, to miss whose mark, to miss God's mark. We will not achieve sinless perfection in the body we have right now. 1 John 1, 8 tells us, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. As believers, we all desire to not sin. We'll see this in chapter 7 next week as Paul cries out, the things that I want to do are the things that I don't do, and the things that I don't want to do are the things I want to do. We'll get to that next week. Verse 19. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. Paul is essentially apologizing for having to use slavery as an illustration because it was so degrading and pervasive, and especially because many of the Romans' readers were, in fact, slaves themselves. But Paul knew that slavery was an absolutely appropriate description. And verse 19 repeats the point that was made earlier. First, we're to present our members of the body as slaves to righteousness. Lord, I'm all yours. Not to lawlessness. That means don't show up for work for your old boss. Imagine that for a moment. You've all heard we're in the great resignation, right? People are quitting their jobs and getting new jobs at record rates, unlike any time we've ever seen in American history. Perhaps some of you have experienced this recently. So I want you to imagine for a moment, you land a new job, a better job, a higher paying job, whatever. And on the first day on this new job, you leave at lunchtime, go back to your old work, tap your old boss on the shoulder and say, okay, here I am. What do you want me to do? You would never do that. Why? Because that's not your boss anymore. It doesn't make sense. It's just not right. Folks, we serve Christ. Let pleasing Christ be our priority. And how do we do that? Verse 19 tells us, lawlessness leads to more lawlessness. Righteousness leads to holiness, which is simply more righteousness. Our habits and our conduct predict the direction in which we're going here. If your habits are leading you in the direction of sin, guess what's going to happen? I'll save you the suspense. You're going to sin. I want to encourage you, do what you need to do. Get rid of the smartphone if you need to. You don't need a smartphone. You understand that. You don't need a TV. Lots of people around the world don't have TV. You'll be okay. Are you willing to take the drastic step necessary to crucify that part and move on? 
I deal with people, I'm sure Pastor Jim could testify to, deal with people all the time. I'm struggling with a sin, struggling with a sin. It has this hold on me, has this hold on me. They're believers, but they are not willing to do the hard things to get rid of it because they're trying to rehabilitate the flesh. It doesn't work. Verse 20 and 21. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. That means you didn't even worry about righteousness because you were slaves of sin. Verse 21, what fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Now, all this talk about sin, we need to recognize that sin can be pretty fun sometimes, can't it? Sin can be thrilling. Sin can be shiny. Sin can be attractive. Sin can be sweet or all the above. It's temptation, right? If you were to tempt me with a plate of steamed broccoli, guess what? That's not temptation. I'm good. I ain't even going to bat an eye. Tempt me with a case of monster energy drinks. Now we got a problem. Monster's not sinful for me. I just, I know this for the Lord. <laughs> Stolen glances turn into thrilling moments with someone who seems sweet, but it poisons the spirit. Yet how often has a few seconds of pleasure sown years of pain for individuals and families and friends? Satan will always use the temptation of sin in a way to try to get us to ignore the prompting and the conviction of the Holy Spirit to flee the temptation. If you've ever gone fishing, you know that a fishing hook is barbed. That's by design. You see, a fish will nibble on the worm a little bit, and you know your bobber goes up and down. And after getting a little nibble and a little nibble and a nibble, little nibble, what's the fish do? And it swallows the hook, and the barb on the hook prevents the fish from getting off. I'm sure the fish wishes he wasn't there. No fish just bites that hook and says, oh, okay, I'm good. No, what's that fish doing? It's thrashing. It's violently trying to get off, but it can't. And folks, neither can we. We cannot free ourselves from sin because Jesus Christ has already done it. Look at verse 22 and 23. But now, look carefully, but now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. These verses describe two unstoppable, inescapable truths. Number one, spiritual death is the paycheck for every person's slavery to sin. Number two, eternal life is the free gift of God that he gives to undeserving sinners who believe upon Jesus. I know we spent several weeks going over Romans 6. I encourage you to read it all in one sitting. And there's three, three words, in my opinion, that really stand out in Romans 6. They're the words know, reckon, and present. Know that you are dead to sin and alive in Christ Jesus. Reckon it so. It's a reality. That didn't come out right. <laughs> it's a reality. It's truth. It's there. And lastly, we're to present ourselves as instruments of righteousness to God. Get behind your identity with your mind and your words and your memory and your eyes and your hands and your feet. Remember who you are. Use them all as tools to promote Christ in your life and in the lives of others. Speak, read, do, go, whatever the Lord calls you to do in ways that fortify your faith. You know, our, our identity determines our behavior. How we see ourselves determines how we live our lives. But then it's those reinforcing actions that 
kind of shore up our identity. If I see myself as a speed skater, but never get out on the ice, I'm not going to be a very good speed skater. And you can call yourself a Christian, but never read your Bible, or fellowship, or worship, or share Jesus with others. And I will tell you, it's going to be very hard to hang on your identity in Christ when pressure gets applied. It's your choice. It's my choice. We all have the choice. God loves us so much that he gave us that choice. And that brings us to the communion table this morning. All because of Jesus. No amount of money, no amount of good works. In fact, we were utterly helpless. Nothing we could do. But God did it for us. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you cannot confidently say, I know that I'm dead to sin and alive in Christ Jesus, then cry out to the Lord right now and say, Jesus, I'm yours. I believe you die for all of my sins. And I surrender. Jesus was in that upper room knowing the cross was just mere hours away. And he blew everyone's mind, even though they didn't really understand it at the time, by instituting the new covenant. That new covenant according to his shed blood. These communion cups we have, this is just a, like a styrofoam wafer. It's not styrofoam, but you get it. It's kind of like styrofoam, right? I joked around with the worship team earlier. We were thinking about using allergy medicine for communion cups today because... The struggle is real. All that to say that this is not actually the blood of Christ. This is not actually Jesus' body. This is a representation. But its significance is powerful because he died for me. And no longer do I have to try and earn God's favor. He's already given it. We're about to partake. Let's first bow our heads. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you gave up your body on the cross for my sins. Lord, help us to remember these truths, that because of your death, we are set free. Lord, we should be the most joyous people in the world, for we are no longer slaves, but we are free in Christ Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. Let's partake of the wafer together. In Luke twenty two twenty, Jesus said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. The Bible also tells us then that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You didn't try to become good. You didn't try. No, you're still a filthy, wretched sinner just like me. And he still died for us. Isn't that wonderful? We're set free by the blood of the Lamb. Let's partake together. Now we know we're in the Midwest. It's been 10 years now that I've lived in the Midwest. I know Midwesterners are kind of reserved. Not super full of expression, outward expression. But in a moment, I'm going to ask you if the Lord's been speaking to your heart. And if you need to be freed from sin and to grasp onto these truths, I'm going to ask you to come forward and stand right down here. I don't care what other people think. This is between you and Almighty God. The truth is here. This is just a remembrance of what the truth is. Grasp me and say, Jesus Christ, I know I am free. I am no longer a slave to sin. If you need to be set free this morning, there has been something in your life that the enemy has used to hold on to you, to grip you, to control you, Let these words penetrate your heart. You are no longer a slave to sin. 
So I'm going to ask you at this time, if you need to be set free, to come on up. Perhaps it's greed. Maybe there's pride. Lust. Studies show that 50% of all church congregations have people who are viewing pornography on the regular daily. And I know it's happening in this fellowship. And if that is you, then you need to stand up and come forward. And remember, you're no longer a slave. How about slander or gossip? If you need to be set free to grasp hold of these promises, just come forward. Again, I don't care about anybody else there, thanks. And you know what? They're praying for you right now. They're not holding you in judgment. They're saying, oh, I wonder what they did. That's not the case. You're family here. It's not how family acts. We need healing. We need cleansing. So if there's anyone else, I'm going to ask you to make your way forward right now. And be reminded of what we just read. This is the truth. Aren't you so grateful this is the truth? This is not some new thing or new idea or 12-step process. This is what it is. Praise God. Hallelujah. This is just an opportunity to remember that truth and ask the Lord to sow that in our heart that we would never forget it. If there's anyone else, I'm going to ask you to come forward at this time. Let's all bow our heads and pray. Lord, you're so good to us. How could we ever repay you? We cannot. But Lord, we stand here today declaring that we are no longer slaves of sin, recognizing the truth of your word. And Lord, I pray for each and every person that the lies of the enemy would be exposed for what they truly are, lies. And that each one standing would remember the truths and the promises of Romans 6, remembering who they are in Christ Jesus. And Lord, you are such a good, good master to serve. Lord, help us to use our bodies, the members of our bodies, our eyes, our ears, our hands, our feet, our mouths, Lord. May they be used just as your word says here for righteousness and holiness. And Lord, you know that we cannot do it on our own. We can't even try on our own. We need the empowerment of your Holy Spirit. So Lord, I pray that the Spirit would fall fresh on each of us here today. Lord, that we would walk in that victory and give you all the praise for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. We serve an awesome God, don't we? I mean, really awesome. I'm going to challenge you to read Romans 6 each day this week. It's only 23 verses. You can do that. That's easy. But know this, Satan's going to do everything he can to discourage you from doing it. Because what you all just saw here, he hates that. Folks, let's love the Lord with all of our heart. Let's follow Jesus, amen? Would you stand with me and let's close in one final song of worship.